I would like to share with you a little bit um, the story about my family. Um, so it goes back to my grandparents on my mother's side. My grandfather came from Athlone, which is a coloured neighbourhood in Cape Town. That's where he was born and raised. And he went to school until he was in standard eight, standard six, which isn't grade eight. Um, so I think he did the first year of high school, but then he dropped out and he worked as a labourer, um, painting. And then later started a business with his dad and his brothers, which was called the Earhart Brothers. And they had a painting business where they um, painted uh, buildings in and around Cape Town and my grandmother so my grandfather's name was Kenneth and my grandmother's name was Martha and she came from a little missionary town called Saron which is a colored village um, outside Porterville maybe like two to three hours outside Cape Town and she lived there until she was eight uh, with her mum she was the only daughter and she I think she had four brothers and she was sent to work as a maid when she was eight years old. And um, she, she stayed in a little hooky, a little shack in the back garden that she shared with a dog. Um, and she was fed the same food as the dog <clears throat> in that shack. And then after that, she went to go and live with her cousin, also called Martha, who lived in Cape Town in Boerkarp. And she lived there for until she married my grandfather when she was 17 or 18 and she worked in a factory paying her rent and paying her way and um yeah so they got married quite young um my grandfather i think was 19 or 20 and she was 17 or 18 and um they had three daughters very quickly my mum was the second born uh, my grandmother, in those days, um, all women of colour were, were served at home. Um, it was part of the, the health system here. So she was tended to by uh, midwives on bicycles who came to her in labour. With the first birth, she laboured at home for three days and then things didn't, it, it just didn't progress at home. So she went to Grutteskir Hospital and she gave birth with assistance to my older aunt there. And then she gave birth to my mum at home uh, about a year and a half later. And when my mum was born, um, the house across the road burnt down at the same time as her being born. And there was a woman inside it. And I always think it's so interesting that in the same road on the same day, there was birth and death happening at the same time. And then my aunt Laura was born uh, about two or three years later. So there were the three sisters. And, um, yeah, and, you know, they, I think they lived a fairly good life, um, uh, you know, happy and with surrounded by family and community. But, you know, in the background, there was um, apartheid <laughs> uh, rearing its ugly head. And um, in, the, in the late 50s, so my mother was about seven or eight years old. Um, my grandfather's parents, um, no, it was my grandfather's brother, that's right. My grandfather's brother made some connection at home affairs. And, um, you know, things were just becoming more and more scary. And, um, you know, there was the, the group area. I, I'm not exactly sure when the Group Areas Act came in. But basically, you know, it just became very evident that things were just becoming more and more divided and and segregated and people and there were the forced removals I think starting to take place because my auntie Martha the one that um, my grandmother had gone to live with she she was living in Claremont later on and she lost her house through the through the forced removals she was moved somewhere on the Cape Flats I'm not sure exactly where um, and yeah, so then, so they made a contact at the home, they had some contact at the home affairs, and basically they, my grandfather's family, um, I assume paid some kind of bribe, and made an arrangement to be able to pass as white, and have white paperwork. 
So this happened when my mother was about seven or eight years old, so that would have been, would have been in the late 50s. And they moved from, at that time, I think they were living in Wetton, and um, moved to Meadow Ridge, which was a white area. Wetton was a colored area, and they moved to Meadow Ridge, which was a white area, and they pretended that they had just moved to South Africa from Portugal. And this meant that they had to cut themselves off completely from any family members who still identified as colored, who were still identified as colored or classified as colored, and had to live this whole lie. And um, yeah, so my grandfather's family, his parents and all his brothers except for one, all reclassified to white. The one brother who didn't reclassify, he had a wife who was too dark to reclassify, and his children were too dark, and so he couldn't. He couldn't reclassify to white. And um, and then, but the rest of my grandfather's family did. And then, but my mother, with my grandmother's family, she was the only one, and you know, she had her her four brothers and now baby sister. She, there was a, a lot of here late a latecomer um, sister born and she had to cut herself off from completely from her family and wasn't allowed to have any contact with them because at that point you know there were people who were living um, as different races uh, in order to survive uh, you know that this was a decision they made I mean, my grandparents would have been about 26 or 27, so they were quite young actually you know now that I look back on it I really realize how um, yeah, they were, they were, they, they found themselves between a, a rock and a hard place. They found themselves cornered and saw an opportunity. And, you know, many, many years later when I was able to speak to my grandmother about it, because they didn't speak about it for many years. They really did live this lie for so many years. Um, she said, you know, for her, it was about her daughters growing up in a place that was safe. She really felt so fearful for her daughters growing up in, a, in, in you know, amongst gangsterism and, and um, just not being safe in, in the coloured areas. Um, and so, yeah, so they made this move and, you know, things that I, I know that my, my mother shared with me were, you know, things like having to learn to, to go in through the front door of shopping centres because up to that point they'd only been allowed to go through the side entrances, which was for people of colour. And the front entrances were for, well, it used to be called non-Europeans and Europeans. So, like, she remembers going shopping one Saturday morning with her grandmother and, and um, the one that had reclassified to white. And she started using the, the side entrance and her grandmother shouted at her because she was meant to be using the front entrance now. And her and her sisters used to um, like go to the cinema on a Saturday, but they would still wear their white school uniforms so that they um, they wouldn't they would actually be let in because if they arrived in their normal clothes, it was so obvious that they were coloured that they wore their white school uniforms in order to still be able to go to the cinema. And yeah, I think. You know, my mother really, even though she was so young when it happened, it really, really was very difficult for her because she, um, yeah, she really missed her family. She missed her cousins. She missed her friends and her community. And she really felt that she had been betrayed and that something had been um, stolen from her. And my grandmother would sometimes sneak away to go and, and, and visit family um, but she used to call it the farm and the farm people so that it wasn't given away that, you know, this was actually family. So it was almost like she was pretending to go and do these charitable visits to the farm when she would go and visit Saron, which is where she came from, the village where she came from. And yeah, and my mother really just like harbored this anger and this resentment throughout, um, throughout growing up because the family really took on this lie. And I, you know, looking back, I really see that my family was very, very fearful, you know, like we didn't list our, um, our phone number in the phone book in case somebody would, f would try and contact us and um, you know, they, 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 they just never could make proper friends with people because they could never be open with anybody. Because the thing is, is that if you were exposed and somebody realized what was actually going on and you were reported, 
you could lose absolutely everything, everything. And so they were just really guarded. They were very tense and very strict, like it was a very, very strict um, environment. And um, yeah, so then when my mother was um, 18, she left, she left South Africa. She, um, yeah, I mean, at, one thing that, that becoming white afforded my grandparents was that my grandfather's business was really able to flourish. And so he, he actually did really, really well and became very wealthy. And so one of the things they did when their girls um, finished school was he, they sent them off uh, to Switzerland, actually, to finishing school to, you know, like receive proper training as ladies and, and hopefully be able to marry well and stay out of the country. Because, again, they didn't feel safe actually having their daughters living this um, existence here in South Africa. This is, again, something that my grandmother admitted to me uh, before she died. Um, and yeah, so my, my mother left as soon as she was able and she went to Swiss finishing school and she, um, and when she was, um, when she was able, she actually reclassified back to colored again. So she did the paperwork to kind of re, um, yeah, reject or, um, yeah, get rid of the white classification and, and reclassified back to colored again. And she would sometimes come to South Africa and visit and, and then be in Switzerland. That's where she studied. That's where she worked. And then she, but she met my dad here in South Africa. And my dad was a white Irishman who lived um, here in South Africa at the time with, with his family, actually. He was married and he had children. And they started a relationship here, which was illegal because he was white and she was colored. And she felt pregnant. And... Um, and then, um, and then, you know, realized that, well, I mean, I think she, she knew this at, at already, but like, I think it really hit her that, you know, having me here wasn't going to be an option. And this was, was in the late 70s. And I was born in 1980. And so she applied for refugee status, actually, in Switzerland at that time. I think she was, she'd been a student up to that point. But basically, what she wanted to be sure of was that she didn't, get um, deported to South Africa um, because she knew that it would be very difficult for her to have me here and for me to be a mixed race baby here in South Africa at that time. And I know nowadays it's very normal and not a big deal to be a mixed race couple and to be a mixed race child. But at that time, you know, similar to Trevor Noah, this was very taboo. And she didn't have an easy relationship with her parents, you know, who were busy living this white existence and trying to maintain this facade and so were her sisters and at that point her brother had been born but he'd been born white and you know for her it was really heartbreaking the way that he was being brought up not knowing the truth you know he'd been told that they were actually from Portugal and that they'd immigrated here and like this whole story had been made up around their family history which wasn't true but it was done to protect themselves so that they didn't become exposed and so, yeah, so then, um, so she applied for refugee status in Switzerland and then um, gave birth to me there and gave birth to my other sister there as well. Both of us were born there. Um, and at that stage, my dad then was living, he moved from South Africa and moved to the UK and he would come and visit us in, um, in Switzerland. And, but he lived with his other family in the UK as well. And then when I was six years old, I came to South Africa for the first time uh, and it was after they'd gotten rid of the Immorality Act as far as I know. You know, this is all during my childhood and pre-childhood so I've kind of had to piece it all together from stories that my parents have told me and both my parents have been, um, have passed uh, 15 and 16 years ago so it's, yeah, I'd love to be able to sit them down again now and, and know more but I'm glad of the of the stories that I do know. But as far as I know, it was the first time that my parents were able to travel here without fear as a family with us. And so when my sister was three and I was six, we came to South Africa for the first time. And it was a very interesting time because, you know, we spent time with my grandparents who were living their posh, white um, existence bubble that they had created for themselves. And then on the other hand, my mother was on this mission to find lost family. And so that's actually what we did for the next three years from 
1986 to 1989, we would come to South Africa for six months of the year, and then we would go back to Switzerland for the six months of the year. And that was the best time of my life because I was going half to school here and half to school there. And we were just going on these adventures, mostly into the South African rural areas to find lost family. And, you know, I met cousins that I had never known. And uh, my mother reconnected with family that she had missed out on growing up with. And, you know, we swam in the, in you know, rock pools in the mountains and, and um, milked goats in the Karoo and... Um, yeah, and during that time, my mother met my stepfather, who lived in the Karoo at the time, with his family, and they fell in love, and um, they ended up buying a farm outside Ceres, which is um, then where we moved to when I was nine years old, at the end of, of 1989, and then t two of my sisters were born here, and... Um, yeah, that's the story that I thought I would share with you just about my family history. And yeah, I think there are so many of these kinds of stories, you know, we all had to figure out a way. Well, people had to figure out a way to survive and, and different people did it in different ways. Like my friend Marie, who I grew up with um, on the farm, she, she, she came from the neighboring farm, you know, she was the daughter of the farmer, the white farmer. And he had, a, he had a wife, a white wife, but they weren't able to have any children. And so they actually came to an arrangement where um, he, they had children with the woman who was the lady who took care of the house, the housekeeper, who was a colored um, Bush, of Bushman descent um, uh, woman. And they had 10 children. He had 10 children with her. And Marie is one of those children. And so she grew up, um, sorry, my dog. <laughs> yeah, Maria is one of the, these 10 children who grew up um, on the farm, um, very much loved and very much part of the family, but always had to hide. You know, if, if, if white people came to visit on the farm, her and her siblings used to have to run and hide in the bushes. And... Yeah, I suppose what I'm kind of speaking into is is, is the mixed race and, and, and coloured history uh, that, that was taking place and, um, you know, like other family members as well. And it happened with my, in my own family as well. You know, those of us who were darker skinned weren't treated as well. Those of us who were lighter skinned were treated better. You know, I have, uh, my cousins used to say, you've got nice smooth hair. They used to love playing with my hair because I was the one who had the straightest hair and I had the fairest skin. And so, um, you know, I was kind of put on a pedestal because I looked the lightest and the whitest. And my grandmother treated me better, the one who had reclassified to white. Um, my sister and I, who are half white, were treated better than our, um, our two other sisters who were darker skinned and who, whose father was colored as well. The fact that our father was white kind of made us get treated better. And I had cousins in similar boats, you know, that um, half the children were um, darker skinned and they were kind of kept in the back and hidden and treated badly. And then the children who were fairer skinned were given better opportunities, better education. So this is something that we are definitely, it's definitely still a legacy of our land and our history and of apartheid. Thank you for listening. <laughs>